Good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about the research evidence on trading hours and harm, then the Newcastle experiment, the Sydney restrictions and last drinks in Queensland. This paper, if you're interested in reading about this, is a paper that's actually due to be online today, although I haven't seen it myself. It might be, the next, it might be tomorrow. It's open access in the Drug and Alcohol Review. So if you just Google Drug and Alcohol Review, go to the page, you should see that in the early online section. So the, the research on trading hours um, up to 2009, when I started to, to think about this, mostly relates to ex the extension of hours because that's what's been happening over the last few decades until quite recently. There's been a general liberalisation and uh, deregulation of the alcohol market in most um, high-income countries. And there's some very good work by Professor Tanya Tsikritsis from the National Drug Research Institute in Perth on what happened when Western Australia, uh, in fact mainly um, changes in Perth, um, extended, uh, permitted extended trading permits. But just notice the time from 12 midnight to 1am. That happened in the 1990s and that looks very tame compared with what we've got in, the, like, in New South Wales where 24 hour trading has been uh, common and still occurs in some parts of the state and where we're still talking, we're arguing about whether 3am or, or later is, is, is an appropriate time to stop serving alcohol. The rest of the evidence concerns unusual, important, but unusual conditions. Um, border crossings, in, for example, between the US and, and Mexico, where there are towns, uh, San, Di San Diego and Tijuana are a good example, with large populations on either side of a, of a border, where people travel across the border in order to access cheaper alcohol, or in the case of the US, to go to Mexico if you're 18 to 20, where you can buy and drink alcohol. Uh, and also there are some border crossings in Canada and between Canada and the US which have similar dynamics. And they're important and there are definitely effects of um, more liberal trading on one side of the border, drawing people across and often getting into more trouble as a consequence because they've got to, they've got to drive, they end up in situations uh, that are higher risk and of course they're exposed to greater alcohol consumption. The other area which is important to Australia is uh, remote communities and there's work from Halls Creek for example and Fitzroy Crossing showing the effects of restrictions in access to alcohol via trading hours and other mechanisms have large, produce large reductions in alcohol related harm. But these are not particularly relevant to the urban policy maker um, you know such as the, the, the state government of New South Wales in, in re regulation of metropolitan areas. So a systematic review conducted by an, Austra uh, an Australian, Tim Stockwell and, and Tanya Tikritsis, um, Tim Stockwell now in, has been in Canada for a long time now, um, examined this literature um, systematically and examined, four, they identified 49 studies overall, but the 14 controlled studies, that is where there were observations before and after the change and in at least one control site, um, covered five countries and they, they found that the balance of reliable evidence suggests that extended late night trading hours lead to increased consumption and related harms. Another study conducted around the same time in the United States split the evidence into two groups. The studies that e examined changes of more than of two or more hours, um, which are quite big changes, and the studies of changes of less than two hours. And the, in relation to the the bigger changes, they find there was sufficient evidence to conclude that increasing hours of sale by two or more hours increases alcohol-related harm. The evidence was insufficient to determine whether increasing hours of sale by less than two hours increases excessive alcohol consumption. So just note that that's um, not evidence of no effect, but it's just uh, a problem of insufficient evidence. The quality and, 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 and uh, volume of evidence was not enough to reach a firm conclusion. So systematic reviews are done in a way that permits the reader to trace the lineage of the inference that's being made at every stage of the inclusion, the identification of literature, the assessment of bias in that literature, and then the, the way that um, literature is synthesised. So these are, these are robust studies. But the, the, the latter finding is important for us because the changes that have occurred in Australia have been of less than two hours. Since 2010, we've had studies in four areas. We've got the Newcastle experience, really important work in Norway, which I'll tell you about. A study in Amsterdam where hours were in, uh, increased and then the most recent experience of Sydney. In Norway, 
um, in the first decade of this century, municipalities were permitted to some authority over trading hours within a band of 1 to 3 a.m. So they could increase or decrease, it was up to them, and many, many, authority, many municipalities um, made alterations in this time. There were 18 cities that made changes, some extended, some restricted, and some extended and then restricted, having seen the problems of extending them. And the bottom line is that in eight cities with extended hours, so this, so this was um, up to two hours, in some cases it was as little as half an hour, they found a 20% increase in assaults per additional hour of trading. And conversely, in the cities that restricted hours, they found a 16% decrease in assaults per hour of restriction. So fairly symmetrical, as a rule of thumb, 20% per hour of trading. In Amsterdam, they went the other way, and this is a contemporary, uh, you know, a more recent confirmation of the systematic reviews I've just told you about. They increased, in, the, in central Amsterdam, trading was permitted to increase till 5 a.m. and weekends and until 4 a.m. on weekdays, with changes of one hour. And they found a 34% increase in ambulance attendances in the central city relative to surrounding areas. So we, then we've got the Newcastle experiment, which I, I know many of you will know something about, but let me just lay it out for you. Newcastle, a lot of people don't know much about Newcastle, especially those from outside of New South Wales, but it's a city of half a million people, um, making it the sixth largest city in Australia. It's 150 kilometres north of, of Sydney. In 2000, late 2007 and early 2008, the police and, uh, and community made a complaint to the state government about high levels of crime from pubs in the CBD, the Central Business District of Newcastle. This was under the Liquor Act of the time. And I've got a picture of Tony Brown here, um, who I pay tribute to. I'm not trying to embarrass him. But I, th I think it's no exaggeration to say that I wouldn't be standing here giving this talk and that none of this stuff would have happened without Tony's efforts. And there's an, some important lessons about that. One, that community advocacy can be enormously effective. It can change things at the state level, national level. Um, but it's incredibly difficult. I, I don't know how Tony um, manages to continue to do what he does and I just am grateful to him for it. But we need to find ways as a community to enable um, that sort of activity and to remove some of the barriers to it because it, it's not something that um, most people are willing to accept as a burden. So the consequence of these complaints was that the Liquor Administration Board, which was a um, a quasi-independent judicial authority, it was a court, um, forced 14 pubs to close earlier. So they had to close at 3 a.m. where they'd been trading up till 5 a.m. and have a 1 a.m. lockout or one-way door. I prefer the term one-way door and there's an important distinction. The laws get talked about generally as lockout laws. Lockouts are one element of them and we really need to get rid of the language. It's, it's unhelpful. It's uh, lockouts, we don't have good evidence that they're effective. Um, what's effective is restricting the, sa the sale of alcohol, the consumption of alcohol through stopping the sale. So last drinks, um, closure or last drinks, but I think last drinks is preferable for various reasons. Um, so the lockouts permit pre uh, patrons to continue to drink alcohol. They just can't leave the premises and re-enter or enter another premises after the, the lockout period. And they create a great deal of animosity um, among patrons and um, and the industry. Well, I care less about that, but the, 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 it, I'm not sure that we um, really need them to produce the effects. This took effect in March 2008. And in fact, only four months later, as a consequence of legal action from the, the publicans they, who got together, um, the police accepted a compromise of 30 minutes. In fact, the community wasn't consulted in that decision. Um, but it was on the morning that the case was due to be heard in court. So then, in fact, what we've got in place in Newcastle is 3.30 a.m. closure and 1.30 a.m. lockout. So this is the Newcastle area. Um, so you've got this strip of a few kilometres here where the, the central business district is, and the, the circled uh, little circled houses are the licensed premises that were subject to the restriction. The ones that are not circled did not have late trading um, licences. Now, what's extraordinary about this and what made it a useful experiment from my point of view as a researcher was that the neighbouring area of Hamilton, just a few kilometres away, um, was left untouched. It has late trading hotels, five of them, along this strip here, Beaumont Street, and it was not subject to restriction. 
Now, I don't think that this was designed as an experiment, but you couldn't have done it better if you were planning it that way. So when the opportunity, when I was told what had happened, my eyes widened, I thought, well, the what's unusual about this decision is it affected so many pubs. The Liquor Administration Board had done this one pub at a time in the past, but that the signal's just not big enough to pick up with, with aggregate data for, for the whole area. So um, uh, to see it applied with su it's likely to produce a strong signal and to have a comparison site to rule out competing explanations such as changes in economic conditions, the GFC occurred in this period, um, was really quite remarkable. This is what the data show. The um, red triangles are the Newcastle, they, they, they represent a quarter of counts, so there are, there are around 100 assaults per quarter in Newcastle before the change, which came in at this dark, this thick line. In Hamilton, it's a smaller area, um, fewer pubs, fewer patrons, but you can see there's just a gradually, slowly increasing trend in Hamilton as well. A lot of the volatility in this series, I mean, it's, it, it's um, partly to do with scaling. If you put them on the scale, the same scale, the volatility would be more similar between them. The bottom line is that this is a highly seasonal and, and variable um, phenomenon. Now, the intervention occurred in March 2008 and you saw a reduction within the first 18 months of 37% relative to what happened in the um, control area where there wasn't really any change in Hamilton. And then continued reductions overall. You can see that now, in fact, we've got data up to 2015, I've, uh, we've published, these uh, counts are down at, f at half what they were prior to 2008, and yet there's been no significant improvement in Hamilton, despite the, inc the implementation of a lockout in Hamilton in 2010. So just to show you that there was not evidence of displacement to Hamilton, and, and you would have noticed it because the size of Hamilton is such that even a small displacement from Newcastle would have been picked up in increased assaults there. Um, the proportion of assaults occurring after 3 a.m. more than halved in the Newcastle CBD and it remained constant in Hamilton. So people were not simply going from the CBD at 3 a.m. or 3.30 a.m. to Hamilton to get into, uh, to assault people there. Okay, Sydney and King's Cross, as you know, the, the Newcastle findings were used extensively in the argument for, for Sydney. But there were much more bigger things that, that probably gave rise to it. Uh, Thomas Kelly here, um, he was 18, he was walking in King's Cross with his girlfriend um, at about 10 p.m. and was punched without provocation, without um, uh, notice, and died uh, a couple of days later in hospital. Um, the assailant was, was intoxicated, but he was also a serial offender who'd punched three other people that night in, I, I think Thomas might have been the third of the four um, in between, you know, uh, Oxford Street and, and King's Cross. There were other high profile, uh, so that was July 2012, there were other high profile serious non-fatal incidents over that period. You'll remember if you're in Sydney that this was in the papers fairly continuously in that time. Um, but government insisted it was doing enough. Uh, it came up with the usual mantras, no silver bullets, no one size fits all approaches. This is about individual responsibility. We need culture change, whatever that is. Um, and Sydney's different to X and you can put anything you like in X. But Newcastle, um, you know, Queensland, and I've heard it from Queensland, by the way, when we went to give evidence in the Queensland parliament, they said, you know, Brisbane's not the same as Sydney. And so you'll always hear um, excuses for inaction. That's what they are, because the evidence is clearly um, generalisable to other um, jurisdictions within Australia. Here's another one of the heroes of this story. This is Dr John Crozier, a vascular surgeon at Liverpool Hospital. And he's been a vocal, um, a vocal advocate for uh, law reform, um, and uh, who's used the evidence, who's continually argued that the evidence be used. And as a, as a surgeon who's dealing with trauma, he has considerable credibility. And in fact, he's one of many um, in, that, in that profession that have brought about change in New South Wales and other parts of Australia. And I think that's another example of, of great community um, coalitions being formed and the medical people understanding their part in this. And they know the, um, they know the um, credibility they've got with the public and that they can be very good spokespeople. The next big event was the death of um, Daniel Christie 
on New Year's Eve in 2013. He was walking, um, this was fairly early in the evening as well, this was around 10 p.m. This was an unprovoked attack by a mixed martial arts trained offender. Um, it was eerily similar. It happened in almost the same location of, on the footpath, I mean. Um, and what was also quite um, moving about what happened is that he took 12 days to die. And in that period in hospital, no, uh, we didn't, most people didn't know his medical status. In fact, there was no chance for him, but it was a matter of turning the life, the life support off. But in that time, the tension built on the government, the pressure built on the government. And you'll recall that Premier Barry O'Farrell um, came out of his summer holiday to deal with this. Uh, he announced restrictions of 3 a.m. last drinks, which is a, a step forward, in my view, from, from Newcastle, and a 1.30 a.m. lockout, and had to, unfortunately, had to also dress it up with mandatory sentencing, which, for which there's not good evidence, but which seemed to be um, a necessary um, feature to be able to get it past the cabinet or the party room and, the, and some members of the public who've been calling for blood. So many of you, will be, you'll be familiar with this, uh, this map and th this is the entertainment precinct um, subject to the restriction in case you're not sure. Uh, you know, this is the King Cross, King's Cross area here. And um, there are some notable exceptions. The casino has been in the news and there are some real issues in the casino. For some reason, it was not included in this area. And the government never gave an, ex an explanation for not including it in the, in the, in the um, precinct. Um, there's also some areas on the boundary. In fact, the western, the Dar Darling Harbour is a strange exception because it's a hot spot for assault. But also on the eastern side, um, you know, uh, Surrey Hills, Paddington. Have you recently talked about the casino? Yes, yeah, there's recent news about the casino um, not reporting assaults that are occurring there. So there may in fact be more displacement there than we, than we found, which I'll talk about. So why did the change occur? I think it's, I've alluded to this, the timing and nature of deaths, young, innocent men, a 12-day coma, Daniel Christie. Um, there were sustained efforts by influential, articulate parents, the Kelly Foundation, the Thomas Kelly's parents, and of course they've had another tragedy of their younger son committing suicide uh, just a few months ago, partly as a consequence of bullying, it seems, um, concerning the lockouts. Um, there's been advocacy from NGOs, including the ADF and professional groups, the Foundation, for, so it fares an, AD, an NGO, but the nas national, Al national, sorry, the New South Wales ACT Alcohol Policy, thank you, um, Alliance and the National Alcohol Alliance, <laughs> I think I can't remember what the other A is, um, strong public opinion. The Murdoch press began criticising the government. They came very late to the party, but it seemed to to you know, be something that the government could not ignore. Then the AHA politics are interesting. I wonder whether they were willing to cut loose these high-risk venues, given that there are so many other um, operators who are, who are not affected by late trading and not, but don't benefit from it. And the summer break, being away from the party room, free of the spin doctors, perhaps having a clearer head. In fact, I gave this talk at, a, at an obesity forum in um, May at the, at the Charles Perkins Centre, and Barry O'Farrell was present. He basically confirmed this account. I present, presented it as a sort of amateur political account, which it is, and he said that this was, was indeed a reasonable representation of what happened. That um, there was also policy relevant research and advocacy for its use in, in policy formation, but it plays a bit part. Here's what has happened in Sydney. There's been a 45% reduction in assaults in King's Cross. That's a reduction of 13 per month. A 20% reduction in the CBD, that's a reduction of 30 per month. So even though the proportional reduction in the CBD is smaller, because it's a much bigger area, um, the population impact is greater. So just bear that in mind, that you've got to take into account the number of people exposed when you're considering the impact of an intervention. I've got, there's a paper that's open access and you can access on the, um, on the addiction website describing these findings. I've got Newtown here because Newtown was constantly brought up in the media as a place where, you know, the, people just said that the crime, the assaults had simply displaced to Newtown. And in fact, that's not what happened. And you can see there's no significant increase after the change. Um, and in fact, um, that's consistent with a, a, a global literature on policing interventions 
that displacement is hugely overrated as a fear, geographic displacement. Um, in fact, what you generally find is diffusion of benefit, that is reductions in the neighbouring areas, not increases. Um, the one exception is the Star Casino where we've found, and this is in the paper, a two assault per month increase. So some evidence of um, displacement, but just bear in mind that it's relatively small compared with a 43 per month total reduction there. Um, and the obvious answer is not that the displacement, not to, not to do anything to limit the lockout, but to, to the last drinks regulation, but to include the casino. So you've seen the um, enormous campaign against the current restrictions, the results of the Callanan review, which were generally good, but sort of left the door open for some extensions, and we're waiting to see uh, what the government will do in response to that. So just very quickly on Queensland, in 2012, the, the Newman-led uh, um, Liberal National Party won government, and the critical thing here is they absolutely abolished, um, you know, uh, they didn't abolish them, they absolutely annihilated Labor. Labor had seven seats left in that parliament. Newcastle, um, Labor adopted a policy based on evidence from Newcastle. I had a visit from a, a Bill Byrne, the member for Rockhampton, proposing this and asking my views on it, and I thought, well, it's good. But what, I thought to myself, what are the chances of you ending up in government? And they weren't high, objectively. In 2014, uh, Anthony Lynham, a maxillofacial surgeon, st stood for the Brisbane seat of Stafford and he won with a huge swing. And his raison d'etre for entering parliament was to deal with alcohol-related harm. He was fixing the faces of people bashed in, in Brisbane um, and that put his elective surgery to, for people who were... Um, uh, waiting to have important surgery back later and later in the week, he couldn't get to them because he was dealing with the emergencies. Against all odds, uh, Labor narrowly defeated that uh, the LNP government and, and Palaszczuk, Amanda Palaszczuk, former governor in February. They introduced a bill to the House. They had consultations with experts. They'd had a scandal whereby they lost um, two key members, and that meant that they needed a um, they needed the votes of crossbenchers, the Catter Australia Party, as it turned out. Extraordinarily, another young man died in similar circumstances. This was at 4 a.m. It was unprovoked, um, Cole Miller, and he was also 18 years old and died in hospital. Uh, I won't, I've run out of time, so I won't go through the detail. It's all in the paper. Extraordinarily, this vote was passed at 2.40 a.m. And I, I've, I've I laugh about it because the, if they'd left the chamber and run to the nearest outlet, they might not have made it by three. Um, so Newcastle, uh, we had closing and a 1 and 1.30 a.m. lockout. Sydney has progressed that by using last drinks. There's no reason to close the premises. The alcohol's the key. Um, Queensland's gone one better and made last drinks the, across the state, with the exception of the entertainment um, precincts, where in fact there are many exceptions that permit 5 a.m. trading that they have to be looked at. They have not introduced the lockout yet and I'm glad, glad about that. In California, you can't buy or drink alcohol after 2 a.m. in a licensed outlet. That's been the case for many decades. Um, it's one simple rule. People don't talk about it. I've lived in California as a young person and I wasn't, wasn't aware of it. Um, it avoids the language of martial law that's how I describe it, the, the lockout, it becomes part of the furniture. It's easy to understand and police, and I think critically it's le it involves less incursion into people's liberties, and you couldn't argue that Los Angeles and San Francisco don't have vibrant um, music scenes. So I'll leave it there, I'll let you read the conclusions. Thank you. A quick question from the floor before we move on, and it has to be pretty smart, please. I just wanted to know, the assault stats, um, are they related specifically to assaults on the street? Or does anyone, has anyone looked at the correlation between DV assaults, for example? So what I'm wondering is, do we know whether, okay, so they're not alone, they can't hang out anymore on the street drinking alcohol, do they all go home and bash up their wives and girlfriends instead at home? Like, is there any correlation between in-home assaults and the street assaults, or has anyone looked into that? A quick response, Kip. The answer is there, is, there has no been no increase in domestic violence at the same, during the same period. Um, it's much more difficult because you don't have the locality, I mean, people travel back some distance to where they're 
to their homes, they're not, it's not occurring in the same postcode. So it's more difficult to study. It's an important question. In fact, we're looking at it in relation to the off-license sales, which were restricted to 10 p.m. And that's probably where um, we, we would see some improvement in domestic violence as a consequence of restrictions to 10 p.m., which the government is now talking about allowing to extend again. So we really need the evidence. Thanks, Kip. I'll give you the $10 after the break for that plug. Um, you've had a very interesting journey, Kip, um, outside the, the strict walls of academia um, into communities, and I really appreciated your presentation. What's your views in terms of the influence of the alcohol industry on the alcohol harm prevention agenda for state and federal governments, but also in terms of the legal jurisdictions and opposing late trading premises or or pubs. It's absolutely essential and it's become a focus of study. It has to become a focus of study. We need much greater transparency. We need lobbyist registers that are actually used, you know, operating properly and we don't currently have that. Um, so I, you know, I think it's an issue. Thanks again. And thanks very much, Kip, for your presentation and your succinctness in answers. Thank you.